we'll go ahead and start streaming on Facebook. Um, but um, as Jeremy said, we have, this is the second in our Baltimore Green Party speaker series. Uh, and we are excited to have Lawrence Grand Prix, uh, who is uh, with the new Timbuktu project and with Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle tonight, talking to us about community control uh, and what that looks like in practice and in theory, uh, um, as it relates to a few important policy issues. Now, um, a couple of uh, a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. There's six of us from the six of us who were working on this one way or another. Um, on screen, you have Jeremy and I who are hosting, uh, and then Ashley and Dana are going to be working in order to make sure that any questions get elevated and that there's a uh, there's folks in the chat uh, and all that that all of the chat questions can be answered. Um, and then Andrew is going to be working in the uh, background to make sure that the streaming works, the production works, and all of that. At the end, we'll make sure that you can uh, that everybody comes on. But um, if you have a question. Uh, please look to uh, please enter it into the Q and A uh, part of the Zoom screen. You should see down on the bottom something that says Q and A, and that's a place where you can ask questions. You can also ask in the chat, uh, but if you ask in the chat, um, Dana will probably end up uh, just moving it to the Q and A so that we can handle it there. If there are questions at the end that haven't been answered yet, we'll go ahead and have Lawrence answer those. Um, we'll have Lawrence answer those on Twitter um, so that we can make sure that the event goes on afterwards. This event will be recorded. It will be available on our YouTube and Facebook pages within the next couple of days, uh, and you'll be able to check it out there. Uh, we thank you all for participating and being involved tonight. Uh, and with that, I want to introduce Lawrence Grand Prix. Uh, Lawrence Grand Prix has been working um, as the Director of Research for Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle um, for several years at this point. He's put out many important policy positions that have moved uh, the discourse in Baltimore City more toward community control and more toward making sure that the most impacted communities have the most important voice uh, in the policies that get, that get shaped. Uh, the Green Party has a core value of grassroots democracy and decentralization, and we think that that value is very in line with the work that Lawrence has been doing to show the ways that we can build new institutions in which communities have democratic control of the resources that are allocated to them. We're very excited tonight to have Lawrence Grand Prix uh, presenting this research and ideas to us, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lawrence, uh, and Jeremy and I will go off screen for a while, and then we'll see you again uh, once it's time for the questions. Lawrence? Thank you for that introduction, Andy. Uh, good evening, everyone. As was stated, my name is Lawrence Grand Prix. I'm Director of Research for Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. We go by our initials LBS. We're a grassroots think tank. That's been working in Maryland, Baltimore for really uh, 10 years. And uh, this issue is more important now than ever. As was previously stated, things have changed over the past 10 years, but especially over the past five years, as the so-called uh, Black Lives Matter conversation has uh, not just entered the mainstream, but kind of uh, taken up a position of uh, uh, institutional credibility and acceptance within major elite institutions. A lot of people are saying that's a huge step forward. Uh, and I think that one of the ways people can understand some how that happened is that the version of Black Lives Matter racial equity that is becoming hegemonic is a very elite top-down driven version. And that version actually serves the interest of stabilizing capital and stabilizing the larger institutions of white supremacy in many different ways. And many people are um, not talking about this, but those who are, are struggling with the notion is the acceptance of the rhetoric, if the acceptance of the appearance of uh, participatory democracy, the acceptance of racial equity, is that worth the risk of the version of it that is accepted being this sort of elite, top-down, technocratic vision of racial equity. And that's really um, what my uh, analysis is on tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, share sound. Okay. All right. So hopefully that should be popping up for you all. Um, so the title I decided to give for this talk is what if people aren't stupid? Participatory democracy versus top-down technocracy. Um, 
So this is a documentary that just came out. It's called Can't Get You Out of My Head. It's from the outstanding British filmmaker, Adam Curtis. And I actually want to start off this talk by playing a couple of minutes from his fourth episode in the six episode series, which is called What If the People Are Stupid? Because it explains um, the rise of this elite top-down vision of governance and what that means for uh, democracy. So I'm gonna play um, just a couple minutes from this documentary and hopefully that'll set the scene for us for the rest of the talk. But at this very moment in the West, the opposite started to happen. The whole idea of mass democracy began to be questioned and undermined from inside the political establishment itself. It began almost unnoticed, hidden behind the wave of enthusiasm after the fall of communism. But a political scientist called Peter Mayer has argued that what happened in the 1990s was that the old idea of democracy started to disappear in the West. And it was replaced by something else, which we haven't fully comprehended yet, or even seen, because it is outside the old categories of politics. Western politicians, Mayer said, literally changed their roles. They gave up being representatives of the people, but instead, they became the agents of a new bureaucracy, which was rising up and promising that it could manage the dangerous and unpredictable force of individualism better than the politicians could. Just as the activists in China had found with Chai Ling, individualism and its drive to self-actualization can corrode and eat away at the collective power of mass democracy. Peter Mayer said the same was now happening in the West. The first politician to confront this was Bill Clinton. He came to power promising to represent what he called the forgotten middle class. But very quickly, within weeks of entering the White House, Clinton agreed to give up on many of his promised reforms and to give power over to the financial world. He did this not through any cynical motive, but because he knew that the old power base of mass politics had gone. No one joined political parties anymore. Organized labor was a vanishing force. Clinton might be in office, but he no longer had the collective power of the people behind him. The power that in the past had allowed politicians to challenge the elites in society. And in the face of that, Clinton decided to give power instead to the new force that promised that it could create a wealthier and happier society. The bankers and the economists and the management experts who were now spreading and multiplying through the corridors of Washington. We know big government does not have all the answers. We know there's not a program for every problem. The era of big government is over. If the new bureaucracy delivered on their promises, it was going to be a wonderful world. But if something went wrong, then the politicians would have no power with which to confront them. The shift in politics had begun. Okay, so that's really what I wanted to show because that really, especially that last part, the idea that if the promises of the technocracy were true, then things would work out. So you're gonna have folks promising you that if you do it this way, whether it be around cannabis or economic development, I can ensure these outcomes. But the problem is that the way that they frame the policies often have no space for genuine democratic empowerment. They may have space for democratic input. They may have space for inclusion, but they will not give power in a fundamental way to the masses of people. Because as previously stated, our entire political trajectory over the past 30 years has been away from mass democracy. And I just wanted to start with Clinton because Clinton has a big impact on Maryland, I think for two reasons. So, in 1988, Jesse Jackson ran for president. 
Um, he was a challenge to the Democratic Party establishment, came very close to getting the nomination. There was a big primary in Wisconsin where he won in Michigan. And if he had won in Wisconsin, he basically would have had enough momentum to steamroll the nomination. And he was um, obviously Black, had a multiracial coalition, but his campaign was really powered by grassroots Black uh, workers on his campaign. So he ran again in 92 against Clinton, and Clinton was beating him. And people, he had a decision to make. He had a decision to make to whether he was going to start an independent Black political party, as people in his orbit were pushing him to do, or was he going to endorse Clinton? And the debate was between a bottom-up grassroots democracy and independent political infrastructure for the masses versus trying to leverage concessions out of the sort of technocratic major Democratic Party. Of course, Jackson chooses to endorse Clinton. And soon afterwards, uh, you could, the one part you can argue with the clip is whether Clinton was actually malicious or cynical when he chose to uh, go away from his promises. But soon after Jackson endorses Clinton, Clinton has this famous moment where he basically chastises Jackson for inviting a Black activist and author named Sister Soldier, who made controversial comments about the LA riots. Basically, white people only care about um, Black violence when we're attacking white people. They don't care when we burn down our own stuff. That got interpreted there as her saying Black people should burn down white people's stuff. And Clinton said, how dare you invite Sister Soldier? This is terrible. And it was his famous Sister Soldier moment. And that's become a political terminology for politicians distancing themselves from what's seen as the radical fringe of their political um, foundational base. And oh, Clinton is important because you can't understand Maryland without understanding both of these dynamics. Is that the Democratic Party is extremely scared of grassroots Black political power because of things like Sister Soldier, because of this notion of not just mass democracy in general, but specifically with the Democratic Party, the fact that the dominant primary base and the uh, dominant voter base is working class Black people. And of course, you can't understand Maryland without understanding Martin O'Malley, whose entire political trajectory is exactly what Adam Kurtz is talking about. He is the technocratic professionalizer. He was, the, 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 you should read some of the things that they wrote about O'Malley. They was like, Baltimore was a sleepy Southern town, i.e. Black people, working class Black people. And Martin O'Malley came in with his useful energy to bring professional governance, i.e. technocracy, to Baltimore. And so the entire, a huge chunk of Maryland and Baltimore's political reality, being a democratic dominant state, is the desire to see technocracy as professionalized government, as efficient government, and the racial connotations within that. That working class Black people aren't uh, able to govern with a high degree of specificity, there's potential for grasp, there's potential for nepotism, there's potential for uh, bribery, and somehow technocratic white people or technocratic highly educated people from any race are the solution to that. Um, and that's the context for every issue in the state. And so we're just going to take a few issues one by one. I'm going to focus mostly on policing because that's the big hot button issue right now. And it's the strongest example of how this theory plays itself out in, in, in I think, specificities that are meaningful. So what's policing? FOP, of course, stands for Fraternal Order of Police. This is a police union. Police union represents police officers against their bosses who are the chiefs. Police union works like almost all unions via seniority. So the longer tenured the cop is, the more power they have in the union, so the FOPs around the country are more conservative. They're not just cops. They are like the oldest cops, the most steep in the wool drug warriors, usually the most conservative reactionary cops. And this is reflected through an ideology known as the Sin Blue Line. And I want to talk about this briefly. I think it is useful to remember this. Um, the Sin Blue Line is, you see it all the time, you see it on bumper stickers. It's become more well known now because of the uprising in 2020. But the symbol line is police symbology for the idea. It's symbology for being pro-cop, but it has an ideology behind it that most people don't know. The ideology is that most people in the world are um, sheep, basically. They're, they're, they're civilized people. And there's this sim blue line, i.e. cops, separating the predators, the wolves, from destroying the civilized world, i.e. the sheep. So it's this symbol line of cops that protects civilization from anarchy, 
reigning over the world. Um, needless to say, in America, that is a racialized ideology. <laughs> that the barbarians, of course, are the brown people, civilized people are white. But it also goes to show you the idea that regular people are not fit to govern because they are sheep, because the civilizing influences have made them weak and docile. And so no regular person should ever govern a cop. So the FOP is against participatory power in any decision-making processes around police discipline, which is reflected in their statement on George Floyd. I know it's um, pixelated and hard to read, but this is a statement they put out that's basically like, look, it was crazy, but I don't believe this incident should be allowed to define our profession. So it's like, yeah, that was messed up, but with the FOP, uh, we still are gonna protect our guys. So there's another side to the policing conversation, and this sometimes gets obscured because we're focused so much on the FOP. But to understand the argument I'm making, that we're making in Maryland, and these dynamics in general, you have to understand the flip side. So there is a network of professional, intellectual police scholars, largely from major cities. And this institution, Police Executives Research Forum, i.e. Perth, is a hub of them. And these are usually people associated with the executives, i.e. the police chiefs. So you have to rank and file the workers at one level, and you have the chiefs who are their bosses at another level. Normally in Marxist theory, you support the workers over the bosses, but this is not a normal situation. <laughs> and I wanna understand some of the dynamics that are somewhat complex, but are really at the heart of what we're trying to get at here. So Perth is a strong network of, again, usually big city chiefs and sheriffs. And they're kind of against the FOP because not because they're not racist, not because they love participatory democracy, but the way the FOP does things gets them in trouble in these big Democrat dominated cities, right? So they want a kind of kinder, gentler face of policing, but they still run everything and not the FOP. So they're against the FOP, but they're pro policing because they're police, right? So, and this is the type of thing where most people wouldn't were surprised over the summer when they saw something like this. This is a statement from the Major Cities Chiefs Association that says those folks should be fired in the, in the George Floyd case. So this was surprising for a lot of people, right? So let's look at the, um, the Major Cities Chiefs Association has corporate sponsors. Who are the corporate sponsors of the Major Cities Ch uh, Police Chiefs Association? We have Amazon Web Services. We have Every Town for Gun Safety. Who funds Every Town for Gun Safety? Michael Bloomberg, right? We have uh, Bank of America, Verizon. And what do, what do these people have in common? This is interesting. The corporations who fund the Black Lives Matter movement? Bank of America, <laughs> Amazon, Verizon, right? So what's happening here? Like, how is, it, it feels like, again, this is a, a bizarro world where you have cops joining with BLM, joining with major corporations. This can be hard to sort out. And the way I decided to try to help maybe crystallize some of this is to think about the spy plane. Think about what you saw about the spy plane in Baltimore. It was recently deemed to no longer be flying. Of course, it was flying every day tracking people's faces. There's a court case called Legion of Beautiful Struggle against, I think, the Baltimore Police Department or something like that, where uh, uh, the ACLU is using us as a plaintiff to sue them. But, but why does it come to Baltimore? It's important to remember, the spy plane is inherently freaking ridiculous. It doesn't fly at night, people get shot at night. It doesn't fly in the county, so as soon as you drive to the county, it's not supposed to be able to track you. So the idea that it can solve crime is ridiculous. So you don't think about why it exists in terms of why it can solve crime, it can't. Think about why it exists in terms of the political economy of policing in major cities. So here's what I think is going on with this five plan. Corporations like Bank of America, corporations like Verizon, corporations like Johns Hopkins, they understand that they need a form of policing that will not cause riots, that is acceptable to the young, multicultural liberal people, they want working for them in the cities and the real estate entities want to sell these people houses to live in the city. So they cannot really jive with the FOP old school, crack people over the head, use the N word school of policing. They need a new woke Black Lives Matter style policing that is more centered on technology, more centered on professionalization, more centered on uh, research elite, technologies as opposed to flooding the streets with rank and file people cracking heads in the street. 
The FOP wants the old school version because they want more man hours. That's what they do is they want more people hired and they want more hours for their people. The police chiefs not only aren't focused on the rank and file, they may not even care if there were less rank and file people in the police department because then that's less people to resist them, right? So even the whole defund, this, this challenges the whole defund police debate, right? Because some of these big city chiefs and sheriffs, they might not even care if you defunded them because they would just trade off those rank and file of people walking the beat who beat people up, cause riots. That political heat blows back on the police chief because the police chief is appointed politically. And they can't fire some of these crazy racist cops because of all these barriers to police accountability built into the system. So they don't mind firing a cop here or there because that assuages the political backlash on them. And that prevents the cities from appearing to have such racist police departments that it will like make a person who is a multicultural knowledge economy worker scared to move to that city. So what we're seeing here is two sides of the same coin the only thing they really agree on is we do not want participatory democracy. And we're stuck trying to negotiate how to produce a strategy that allows for participatory democracy in the midst of these dynamics. So I know that's a lot. We can flush them more out in the Q&A. And I'll give you some examples of how this functions around the nation. So again, it's pixelated, but this is the city that really did abolish the police. Some of you have may have heard about Camden, New Jersey. Supposedly, this example of real grassroots organizing, doing what people say they want done in policing. So Camden is in New Jersey. It's a small, predominantly black town. They had issues with police brutality and they actually disbanded the police department. Everybody had to reapply. Um, some of those people got rehired. They had restructured the um, administrative system and um, they ended up spending way less money on policing. So people say this is real life abolish the police and real life defund the police. Um, this is bullshit, for lack of a better word. And this is exactly the okie doke that we have to avoid. So what really happened in Camden was basically union busting. The police unions, in addition to protecting police from getting fired, they secure crazy overtime and crazy benefits for their cops. So when they, just, when they disbanded the police department, essentially because they were beating the brown people and like being too racist. The flip side of it was, we're going to make you reapply, but we're not going to let you unionize. So we're going to defund the police by taking out your union and slashing the budgets. Now, whatever you think about that, uh, what the cops deserve that, that's not what we said. Most people mean when they say defund the police. And again, what did they do with the money they saved? They increased techno surveillance to accommodate for fewer officers on the streets. So as the article says, the only thing that was beneficial was when the activists were brought in after the fact to push back against the techno state that was produced in Camden after they abolished the police and produced the new techno police. That's where the, that's where the utility came in. And these are a lot of uh, Obama administration alumni basically trying to sell the media who don't know no better that Camden, New Jersey is the best practice, remember that term, for defund the police, where it's really just, again, Obama people doing a version of policing that's amenable to real estate interests. Because that was another huge thing in Camden. There were huge developers pushing for basically a new, more amenable system of policing so they could gentrify Camden. And understanding some of these dynamics, we can get into what's happening specifically in Maryland right now. So as a lot of you know, Maryland has uh, really severe laws limiting the stipulations around firing a cop when they're accused of wrongdoing and investigating police. Uh, you cannot investigate a cop if you're not a sworn police officer, so that inherently neuters all independent investigatory bodies. Also, to fire a cop, they have an appeals board. The chief produces the discipline, the chief is the boss, but they have the right to appeal the chief's decision to basically an appeals court consisted only of other cops. And this is, they call it a trial board. The fact that they had a trial is ridiculous. Like they got fired. You don't get a trial when you're at Arby's and your boss fires you for screwing up the order, the, the fry order. But they have an entire process. Now the question is, where do you invest the authority to do discipline? Do you, do you modify the trial board to maybe include a few non-cops? Or do you give the authority to the chiefs to, to neuter the power of the FOP and to create a space for regular people 
to push back against the chief because he is politically appointed. So here's what the Baltimore Sun says in that debate. Um, supporters of keeping discipline in the department say it holds one person accountable. So this is people like us saying the chief should be the one person held accountable. That may be true somewhere like Baltimore, which is under a federal consent decree monitored by a judge. There's little option of doing the right, uh, uh, outside of doing the right thing. But in small towns where there's less scrutiny, a police chief or sheriff wields a lot of power and might be tempted to protect a fellow officer or the reputation of a department over the rights of mistreated individuals. Police have proven too many times that they cannot police themselves. So this is the Baltimore Sun coming out against our police accountability plan to just completely eliminate the trial boards. And what they're saying and what political leadership is saying is that we should appoint two non-police officers to the trial boards. Now, this is important because this is technocracy at work. This is the nuance of technocracy. What do they say? First, they say the consent decree is the reason why it would work in Baltimore. The consent decree in Baltimore is a catastrophe. The consent decree is the epitome of a top-down technocratic theory of change, where you bring in lawyers from the federal government and you basically do a bunch of procedural bullshit and call that revolutionary change. So they say the consent decree makes it so that Baltimore would work, but other small towns around the state. And this is, this is the new um, woke attack on participatory democracy. So what they're saying is that there are other places in the Eastern Shore, Western Maryland, where the police chief might be too willing to not fire somebody. Even though the reality is that the FOP loves the trial boards because um, they control the trial boards. The, as I said before, police chiefs have an incentive to fire people because those people make it hot for them politically. It's a hot button issue. So with no evidence, with no evidence whatsoever, the Baltimore Sun editorial board makes a theory, and this is the theory, that we in Baltimore, working class black and brown people cannot have participatory democracy because we as the technocrats on the trial board have to protect you or, or protect people around the state from dangerous, not woke people in the Eastern Shore and Western Maryland who would put too much pressure on the chief to be racist. So we need to not give you participatory democracy because participatory democracy would empower the racists. And, and, and this is actually an extremely common argument throughout even other issues we'll talk about here, that because of what happened in DC in January, you're hearing this very powerful argument from people in high positions of power that we can't have participatory democracy because America's just too racist for that. We need to have woke, elites, theoretically those that woke elites will be the individuals in the trial board. In reality, um, these technocrats have no public accountability. There's no way for us to hold them accountable because they won't mention the processes of who chooses these people on the trial boards. In previous iterations of the bill, these were administrative law judges, i.e. lawyers who worked for the state who were going to be these civilians. And they don't know anybody in, in, in working class people in Baltimore for the most part. Like they're just as separated from the community and I can't get them fired. I can't vote them out. There's no leverage point for participatory democracy. And, and again, this is pixelated too, but this is just an article I wrote. I've one of the very few people that's actually seen a so-called trial board. It's a goddamn kangaroo court. Um, hearsay is admissible. Hearsay just means that if someone's not in the courtroom, you can legally state what they told you and even though they're not in the courtroom and you can't call them to the stand to see if it's true, that's admissible evidence. So if hearsay is admissible, you have carte blanche just to lie, just to lie and make up stuff that someone you say told you that can exonerate any cop that's under scrutiny. Um, there are two sides in the, in the trial board. One is the union, the FOP, representing the officer who's appealing his or her punishment. The other side is internal affairs. The internal affairs office of the police department is the so-called prosecution. So it's still cops policing cops. There's no space for an independent investigatory body to actually bring in evidence from outside the police department's research because the people pushing this trial board action have muted the bill and completely left out of the Sun article, completely left out of their bill, independent investigatory power for civilian review boards. That would be the only thing that would make a trial board worth a damn. If, if you had someone who's not internal affairs, who's underfunded, who's overworked, who is a cop <laughs> trying to make an argument to people who don't know the law, people who don't know the places where these accused 
accusations of wrongdoing go down, like working class communities in West Baltimore, whoever these people are, whether they're lawyers, whether they're cops, they have no accountability to the community. They have no knowledge of what's going on in the community. And the people pushing this bill in the name of community have neutered the only provision of the bill that would give community a say in the process, which is the investigatory panels and having the chief held accountable because we can vote the chief out. We can vote out the mayor who appoints the chief or we can make appointment of a new chief part of a mayoral campaign. So this is part of just a larger trajectory where people don't trust democracy. Um, and so just an example of what this leads to. This is a document produced by the Police Executives Research Forum, Violent Crime in America, Tale of Two Cities. This is where they got the idea for the Gun Choice Task Force. Specifically, elite technocrats in the police department took the ideas from Perth to do a Gun Choice Task Force in Baltimore. And because the Gun Choice Task Force had no connection to community, had no accountability, it came from these elite top-down networks, it became one of the the most corrupt police entities in America. There's a new book out today from Justin Felton called We Run This City, where they talk about the Gun Trace Task Force stealing drugs, dealing drugs, um, literally breaking the bones of old ladies selling churf raffle tickets on the corner. People don't talk about that. It's, it's super villain level uh, criminality. And it happened because the entire structure of the police department is anti-democratic, not from the FOP but from the side of the elite technocrats who want to dominate the institution from the top down with this network of research folks from this nonprofit system. That's, that's, that is what gave the Gun Trace Task Force their juice. That's because they had credibility as a best practice from Perth. They had credibility as a national best practice from the Able Foundation, from the powerful philanthropic entities that fund Perth. So it's not just about the FOP. It's about community control of police. And there's this weird thing happening where people are trying to leverage community control against defunding abolition. And it's silly because it should be both and or community control as a precondition for abolition. Um, but we're having this weird debate where people are literally trying to attack like people who've worked in community for decades using the word community control of police because that's what the Panthers said. What they really mean is community control of the public safety function. They mean defund police. They mean rethinking alternatives to policing. But because there is this assumption that working class Black people are stupid, are subject to being seduced by capitalism, and lack this nuance, a lot of college educated woke activists are attacking longtime working class community control advocates for not being woke enough and not using the proper rhetoric around abolition and defund the police. It's ridiculous, but this is the world we live in. So specifically, the changes we're looking to do now is that we need to get, the Senate just gutted the LEOBR repeal bill in a, in a voting session where of course no one was there because of COVID, they amended onto the bill amendments written by the FOP. And again, completely Democratic controlled Senate voted with the Republicans to completely neuter the LEOBR bill. So we're giving these amendments attached to the, the, the bill in the House. So we need to push the bill in the House to reflect independent investigatory power and repeal the LEOBR to create space for grassroots people on the ground to put pressure on police chiefs to do the disciplinary action necessary. Basically, what's happening here is people just assume that if we don't, we're trying to mandate um, the illusion of participatory democracy. You can't mandate participatory democracy. What you can do is you can create leverage points to allow participatory democracy's power to funnel up and actually impact the situation. What people are doing is creating the illusion of moments of participation, like the trial bar, as opposed to actual inflection points where the community can actually show its power. I think some people just literally assume that people are too broken, too broke, too busy to actually use that leverage. So they think they're doing them a favor by doing something like putting two siblings in the trial board and making it so the trial board remains the entity that does the discipline. Some people are cynical, but some people really think they're doing folks a favor. And this is because of the decades, I think of racialized and class-based ideology that assumes that working class people aren't smart enough to be able to advocate for their own interests. 
So again, I know that's a lot, but um, the policing issue is just so important and it sets the framework for some of the other issues that we wanted to hit on. So in the last few minutes that we have, I know we're running short on time, I'll try to hit on some of these other issues. Um, economic development. So when you think of economic development, the term they use is the anchor institution. And the anchor institution is supposed to be the stable foundation institution like a hospital, university, that produces economic development in community. I think I have to think of this kind of the other way around. Because if you jump into the ocean with an anchor, you're going to sink, right? So in many ways, these anchor institutions are dragging our communities down rather than stabilizing them. And that's kind of the center of this debate around economic development. So the Cleveland model, this evergreen cooperative, is a very, very woke nonprofit model that's getting a lot of traction. What they're basically doing is using the anchor institution in Cleveland, like the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, and they're basically making it so the people in the hood can like do their laundry, can do their food service, can do their landscaping to cooperative economics. And this is becoming a best practice, remember that word, in <laughs> economic development, so much so. The Hopkins basically did a, a crappy version of the Cleveland model. They didn't do cooperative economics, of course, <laughs> but they did this big push for local hiring saying, we are the anchor institution in central and east Baltimore. We're gonna hire uh, working class people to work for us. Now, the issue with that is that this still maintains these dominant institutions as the powerful entities in the community. So some of you probably saw the slide early. The flip side of that is they get to control everything, including policing, including the situation in the community where Hopkins is going to hire some people, but then they're going to push $600,000 for the Hopkins police force. So when you have an entity that has that kind of economic power, it does the exact opposite of community empowerment because they're the dominant political force. And so if the community wants something that's against Hopkins interest, they can't push back against Hopkins because they all work for Hopkins. So what you have to do is develop grassroots economic models that build on the existing networks of commerce and skills and community and put money into them so that the people themselves can become the anchors of the community. So one model that does this is called the Promissorium. The Promissorium is a model produced by John Lewis, who was a longtime community economic development specialist at formerly at the General Douglas College, was an independent, uh, a, a black owned college in East Baltimore in the Old Town community. He's been working for years to get money to basically invest in indigenous entrepreneurs and working class communities. Because again, the assumption is these people are too broken and poor to make, um, to do, to make money. What's happening in reality is that people are making money all the time. They just don't have an LLC or 501c3, so it's not being reported on their taxes. So the people studying them literally can't see the economic activity because their ac academic lenses can't function in ways that account for them. So the so-called gray market, not people selling drugs, we'll get to that, but the gray market of people doing hair, people doing nails, people doing graphic design, people doing catering. Catering is a huge, huge business. People doing party promotion. Hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars flows throughout the black community, people doing landscaping, people doing plumbing, but none of it is seen within the dominant economic system as worth investing in as those people themselves could be the anchor institutions. What the promissorium says is we're going to invest in those people, we're going to find them, map them, see where they are, see who they are, and find a way for these people to connect and cooperate economically. So if you have a perfect doing graphic design, the person who needs a flyer, they might live right next to each other, but because of the nature of our current world, they may not know it's someone right next door who can help their business. And you invest money in the business, you invest money and give them skills like bookkeeping and marketing so they expand their business. So you turn side hustles into full-time jobs. And an example of this in Baltimore is the Black Arts District. The Black Arts District was just gonna go off the ground when COVID hit, but it is in Pennsylvania Avenue and it's a uh, Black, led community economic development strategy to use arts and culture of black people as an anchor for the West Baltimore corridor. So I would ask folks to continue to look into the work that they're doing as an example of just uh, being uh, manifested practically. Similarly, the dominant, the most glaring model of this in around the nation is the Jackson Cush plan. So Jackson, Mississippi, of course, uh, is the capital of the state of Mississippi, very Republican state. But the town itself is majority black and had a radical mayor, radical lawyer, Chokka Lumumba, elected mayor in 2012. He was uh, a 
Asada Shakur's lawyer, amongst other black radicals. And he uh, moved to Jackson as part of the Republic of New Africa in the 70s. And they have produced a theory of economic self-determination in the majority black communities you know, around the Mississippi River. And this has produced participatory institutions like cooperation, um, uh, the, the Jackson People's Assembly. The Jackson People's Assembly is actually the picture from the beginning of the talk. So that is a participatory body separate from the Jackson government that does participatory budgeting, that actually takes people and teaches them the dynamics of local governance. And the people actually vote cooperatively on what they want to see in the budget. And that is handed to the mayor and they have to be accountable to this participatory body for decisions around the entire budget. A lot of what we call participatory budgeting is just basically a sandbox where they give you a few million dollars and you think up some cute programming and they, they put it up for an online vote. But Jackson has done it fundamentally differently where the entirety of the civic budget is up for conversation. And it's done in a way that these bodies are not directly connected to the city governance. These are institutions produced by the people who did the Malcolm X grassroots movement who uh, were a, a independent black organizing force putting pressure on the city governance to be accountable to them, even as uh, Chokwe Lumumba's son, Chokwe Antar Lumumba took over the mayor's spot in 2017. So when you hear Jackson, some of you will probably have heard of it, but you'll hear Cooperation Jackson. Cooperation Jackson is the nonprofit. It's basically the catch-all for all the philanthropic money. But the actual engine of the Jackson movement is the People's Assemblies, the Malcolm X grassroots movement, the Jackson Kush Klan, and the decades of organizing that happened before Cooperation Jackson started doing its thing in 2017. So this is important because these are the participatory models that are oftentimes um, under theorized because of the nature of the academy and the nonprofit community, just saying, oh, Jackson is black folks doing co-ops. No, black folks is using co-ops as a tool to manifest indigenous black organizing and indigenous black cultural practices. So the last issue is cannabis. Um, this is a big issue. We may have to roll some of this into Q and A, um, but I do wanna hit on this and, and, and I'll just do the critique of, of what happened in Illinois, and then we'll just, we'll, 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 we'll flesh out the rest of it in the Q&A in terms of what's happening now. So Illinois is held up as a national best practice, hear that word again, for reparations for the war on drugs. And the bill's actually written, it looks good. They took 20% of all the tax revenue from legal cannabis statewide and put it in a pot that was gonna be given out for programming that's reparative to the harm of the war on drugs. So that sounds good, the issue. Who did they select to decide what gets funded? It was four political appointees from the Senate, four political appointees from the governor, and three token returning citizens. Returning citizens and people who are formerly incarcerated who have now been released. So this is, again, this is token participatory democracy. So in addition to only having three returning citizens, and again, these returning citizens could be anybody. They could be people who are died in the wool uh, black conservatives or died in the wool black capitalists. Um, but look at the criteria that they used to make these decisions on what got funded in Illinois. I know you can't read all of it, but let's look at the buzzwords, because these buzzwords are going to pop up in Maryland. They're popping up right now, not just in cannabis, on literally everything. Everything where they're talking about giving money out, these are the buzzwords they sneak in to keep participatory grassroots people from getting funding. Social determinants. Right? Social determinants is, again, public health language that's deeply academic, that's geared towards people who have connections to academic public health departments. Evidence or best practice research. So you need to have proven that someone else has already done the thing you're trying to do. That's the only way you get evidence, right? It's an inherently conservative metric. And who determines what's practice is best? It's not the community, it's the academics. There's no connection, to no accountability to community. They may have a connection to community, but they have no structural mechanism of accountability to community. Data collection, very expensive. Most programs can't afford to do it. Monitoring and evaluation. So you need to have, evaluations can cost, um, when you're doing programming for use or, or programming in general, they tell you the evaluation generally costs like two or three times what you paid to do the program. So if your program costs $200,000, the evaluation can cost $400,000. So can regular people in the hood get that kind of money? Can people who are formerly incarcerated for selling weed get that kind of money? No, but that's what they needed upfront 
to get access to the reparations fund in Illinois. This is how they get you. And again, um, this is going to be even worse in the future. Public health approach. Public health is becoming the lens through which people evaluate all problems related to poor people and Black people. And they do it because they think that they're making the argument that racism is a public health problem. And we, if we just showed the objective harm of racism and poverty, we would be able to show people that you need to spend money addressing these problems because otherwise people are going to get sick and go to jail and you're going to have to spend money on them in the future, more money on them in the future. What this does is this locks in public health ideology. And we, as many of you understand, it's not just a question of Black people being excluded from public health institutions. It's that many of them have objectively racist ideologies that are then projected onto community and pathologize community through the lens of public health. So now we're talking about public health approaches to violence in Black communities, which basically assumes the Black community itself is plagued by the disease of violence. There's a cause of the disease of violence. And we need to have, again, largely white, but at times multicultural, but all of them highly educated degreed experts come into our community and save us from our pathological disease of violence. This is the ideologies that are being used to freeze us out of even funding deemed reparations. And an example of this, just 30 people just got um, access to this money. I can't go through the list of all 30 in Illinois, but I'll just give you one example. The National Diversity and Cannabis Inclusion Alliance, this is a uh, organization that claims that they give access to jobs and training for people to do cannabis related stuff. Here are the jobs, um, master trimmers, cultivators, retail management, and bud tenders. So they're not doing entrepreneurship. All four of those trainings are for making these black folks appendages of larger, almost entirely white, previously existing cannabis companies. So they're not empowering grassroots street entrepreneurs to use their indigenous expertise to run their own business. They're sucking them into the existing ecosystem of, again, almost entirely white, but even if there are a few black and brown people, entirely affluent, large cannabis dispensaries and growers. So this is what you might call predatory inclusion where they're using the illusion of empowering black, uh, poor and black working class people, but really just using, tying their skills and their expertise into in increasing the credibility and the profit margins of already existing um, businesses that take up to, um, to open a dispensary or do a full scale growth for cannabis, a dispensary costs anywhere from five to $10 million in upfront capital. A full scale cannabis grow costs between 15 and $30 million upfront capital. Regular black and brown people, especially those who have criminal justice involvement are never gonna get that kind of capital. So we're all talking about making black people and brown people appendages of already rich people getting richer. And we're calling that reparations for the war on drugs. And the coup de gras, the cherry on top is look who's on that board. None other than Freeway Rick Ross himself. Yeah, not the rapper Rick Ross, but the actual drug dealer who the rapper Rick Ross took his name from. Now, he turns his life around. He's definitely a smart businessman, but he's from L.A. Everybody knows Rick Ross is from L.A. So on a basic level, why is Rick Ross's L.A.-based organization getting money in Illinois? Doesn't make any sense. But it does if you understand that what they're doing is, again, laundering the illusion of participatory budgeting, the illusion of operations through organizations that already have a track record, already have a lot of funding and have celebrity faces like Rick Ross. So when people say, hey, this process was bullshit, regular people didn't get funded, they can then say, no, uh, formerly incarcerated people got money. We gave money to Rick Ross's organization. So all the other money they gave to all the other white savior bullshit, for lack of a better word, gets laundered to the fact that they gave money to Rick Ross's organization. These are the technologies of the new woke technocracy that are designed to strategically freeze black and brown people out of opportunities for power and opportunities for funding. So what we need is a grassroots theory of reparations that gives people inflection points to leverage grassroots power. This is not easy, but similar to the thing we did with policing, isolating the chiefs as the inflection point for funding for reparations for the war on drugs, we're isolating the cities and localities as the inflection point. So if you keep that money in Annapolis, the technocrats will control it. And there's nothing I can do or I think we can do to really stop that. 
We saw it with Justice Reinvestment. Justice Reinvestment was basically marketed to us as reparations for war on drugs. There was this extremely technocratic vision of letting a few people out of jail and using the cost savings to reinvest in communities. None of that money went to communities. 35 states around the nation did some version of justice reinvestment, zero. Not a single state in the nation actually invested in grassroots organizations doing preventative work, which was the entire theory of the bill. And the reason they didn't is because these small grassroots organizations didn't have evaluations. They didn't have three years of auditor financial statements. They didn't have academics vouching for them saying that they were the best practice. So the money went to existing almost entirely white-led, white-run nonprofits. And actually, most of the money just went to pretrial services. It just went to a different part of the criminal justice system. This is how technocracy does its work. It will gaslight you into thinking that you're passing a policy that they're claiming is reparations, or it's defunding police, or it's defunding the prison industrial complex, and literally leave out that money through their social networks back to solidifying the very people and institutions that want to keep you out of power. And that's what we're facing with cannabis. The cannabis bill has the money being decided upon by a political appointee appointed by uh, the governor. Now they have recommendations from the, the leader of the House of Representatives, but that leader of the House of Representatives has a chief of staff who is the top political hit person for the O'Malley political machine. So having the chief of staff or the leader of the House of Representatives recommend people to do the cannabis reparation fund because you think you're freezing out the Republican governor, is just picking the wolf over the, the fox, the, you're picking the fox over the wolf in that debate. And we don't want to pick either of those. We want to have the ability to be our own ant army and represent ourselves. So wrapping up, and thank you for your time. I know it's a lot going on, but to sum things up, the first, rain, the, most people have heard the Rainbow Coalition from Jesse Jackson. And it was his multiracial, theoretically working class movement that gets seen as the Rainbow Coalition. Of course, that Rainbow Coalition then gets sucked into the Clinton machine and we have our current woke technocracy. But the first Rainbow Coalition, as some of you may have saw from the movie Judas and the Black Messiah, critiques the film aside, was in Chicago when the Black Panthers, the Young Patriots, and the Young Lords formed a multiracial coalition of radical self-determination focused groups that, many, that were all armed. And their slogan was black power for black people, brown power for black people, red power for red people, yellow power for yellow people, and yes, white power for white people. And what we're having here today is people using the threat of participatory democracy producing more white power for poor and working class white people. And the reason why poor working class black and brown people don't get participatory power. And we need to remember the radical call of the first Rainbow Coalition to say, yes, it's entirely possible that poor working class white people would use things with their power that I may not like. But it is absolutely guaranteed that elite technocrats will do probably even worse things with that power. They're going to be even harder for me to fight against because they're going to use the theory of them saving me against my attacks to check them. So poor working class black, white people doing racist stuff with their power, I can fight that. Elite technocrats claiming to protect me and doing similarly dehumanizing, depersonalizing, disempowering stuff with that power. If you have to pick one, you might actually want the former as opposed to the latter. And additionally, I'm not so sure that poor working class white people would choose to do crazy, ridiculous stuff if they, for example, controlled a few million dollars of cannabis money. They probably fund things like drug treatment. They probably rationally choose things in their self-interest because as oppressed people, people who are oppressed generally make rational decisions from their own experience of oppression. But we're being told over and over again, especially after the events of January 6th, the invasion of the Capitol, that we need to protect working class black and brown people from broad participatory white racist power with elite technocracy woke technocracy, and this is the biggest single threat to broad-based participatory power in Baltimore, in Maryland, and around the country and the world for working class black and brown people. And we need to recognize it, strategize around it, and fight it. Um, so yeah, I know that's a lot, um, but with that, I am open for questions. Fantastic. And I'm gonna Thank turn you. off the screen share. 
Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, and I I will start off this question with one that I start off um, most of these series with. Um, and then I encourage people to, before I do, uh, please use the Q&A or the chat in order to put your questions for Lawrence um, and, and we'll, we'll go ahead and ask them. Uh, I'm gonna ask one question, Jeremy has a few, and then we'll get to some of the questions in the Q&A uh, after that. So my question is, uh, what role do you see for the Green Party and other grassroots parties outside of the two-party system in order to challenge this woke technocracy and advocate for and build independent political power? I think the biggest thing is um, just being present, being precise in your analysis, and just being very clear that you do not stand for the laundering of the theory of protecting black and brown people from, um, again, this hypothetical um, danger from participatory democracy. Uh, black and brown people don't need protection, especially not from the people who are oppressing them. How, it, it's, it's literally the abusive relationship argument that many people make around the Democratic Party that many black and brown people were a captured political constituency. So no matter what the Democratic Party does to us, the theory is that the Republicans are always worse. Well, now the Republicans, um, again, that theory is supercharged by this whole January 6th argument where they're arguing that these aren't just regular Republicans, these are um, people who are uh, now in league with the deepest, darkest uh, forces of um, American evil. And no matter what, we need to produce, we need to protect you from that. And I think part of it is just, you know, being very clear in your communications around what the compromise position of the Institutional Democratic Party is and why it doesn't make sense. So again, no one who has seen a trial board will defend keeping the trial boards unless they are technocrats or cops, unless they truly believe we cannot do better, unless they have no faith whatsoever <laughs> in working class black and brown people advocating for their own self-interest. I mean, I just, I, I, you, you you all should probably just read the thing I wrote about the trial board. They just lie. <laughs> and the, in no amount of, rec of civilians, again, they say civilians like it is, again, this, this magical civilian. It's probably just some random lawyer or some random friend of a person in political power or some uh, toady that they're going to put in a trial board. This isn't like Ellie, this isn't like, you know, Mississippi burning where they have a righteous lawyer stand up and say, I object. There wasn't a single objection at the trial board. Um, they're cross-examining cops. The cops just refuse to answer the questions from internal affairs. You know, and like, what are you gonna do? Hold them in contempt of court? What are you gonna do? Write, write the cop up for not participating in the trial board? Send them to a trial board for not participating in the trial board? Like, what are you gonna do? It's a Kafka-esque, ridiculous situation. But they use this argument, uh, again, assuming that regular working class black and brown people, if we had an independent investigatory body, they call that the kangaroo court. That's literally what the Republican called it. Um, and it, it's just really important for, again, folks like the Green Party to say, no, this is what a trial board is. Because people think trial board, we are taught to have positive associations with lawyers if you're a liberal in this country. If you're a liberal in this country, you're taught that lawyers are the civil rights movement for the most part. Brown v. Board, um, elite lobbyists. Now that people were on the street marching, but you're basically taught that these lawyers saved America. And, and, and now with the Trump world, you have the, the lawyers suing Trump and the FBI, the, the Mueller report. There is this entire um, propaganda around the notion that the elites are here to protect you. And that they, the, the, the courts are supposed to be a counter-majoritarian institution because um, judges have lifelong tenure. And so you were sold from the, the beginning of your education in America that courts protect people who are oppressed. And so they just, that is, that is wrong. <laughs> courts are extremely conservative institutions. Courts respond to political pressure. They are not these elite technocratic people theorizing from on high. And the trial board ain't a court. So even if you believe that, that's not what the trial board is, but they're using all of this built up goodwill that again, mostly middle class and elite liberals have around this theory solution that courts are kind of majoritarian institutions that protect um, oppressed people. 
to not only support the trial board, but to support the consent decree and All support right, so me, any of these interventions. Let me go ahead and turn it over to Jeremy. He has a couple of questions and then we'll get some of the, crowd, uh, the questions from the chat. Okay, Jeremy, go ahead. All right, so you mentioned briefly the law enforcement office, law enforcement officers bill of rights. Um, I'm going to ask if you can like explain your organization's role in that because I know LBS has been doing some work around that for the past couple of years, like again since 2016. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. That. What so, obstacles to the abolition mm -hmm. do you think have come up, especially with the now well Democrats in Annapolis, reportedly um, just totally like ruining that. Well, can you explain what happened and like. So, so there are a few things that are happening. Yeah, the, this is all about whether a cop gets fired from their job. There's an entirely separate conversation whether cops should go to jail. Um, it's very rare for any cop to ever go to jail. So the cops are not scared of going to jail. They're scared of losing their job. So if you are strategically focused on what will produce deterrence from cops beating up people, focus on getting them fired. Because that's what they're afraid of. Um, so the so cops are public employees. Public employees have protections from you know, being fired for racist reasons, being fired for frivolous reasons, and their union negotiates those reasons. So because they're cops and they have all this political power and they have all this racist fear of crime, cops have produced a, an assemblage of protections from basic accountability that's far beyond any public employee or any other private employee. And that's really produced through collective bargaining at a local level between the police union and the, um, the the local localities, the local administrations, but the statewide law, the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights sets a baseline of protection that no locality can collectively bargain beneath. So Maryland's Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights sets the highest uh, floor for protection from investigation, protection from uh, being accountability of any state in the country. And no locality can collectively bargain anything that would violate the state LEOBR. So what we're saying is just, just repeal the LEOBR. Give the localities the ability to negotiate their own accountability system so we can actually put some of this stuff into practice like independent investigatory um, bodies that are not affiliated with internal affairs or the police. But what they're, what they're saying is you cannot trust localities to negotiate um, these um, disciplinary decisions because they don't know what they're doing. And they're making the same argument where it's like localities in Western Maryland and localities in the Eastern Shore might negotiate something worse than currently exists. Frankly, I don't know how it could get much worse. Also, you could, as we have argued, do a state law, which sets a baseline for accountability as opposed to a baseline for police protection that accommodates that reality. The reality is they just don't want to do it because of racism. <laughs> and they're using this logic of we need a statewide best practice and trial boards are the existing best practice. That's what they're saying. And they're even trying to use our position from a few years ago against us. Because a few years ago, we were arguing, well, the trial boards are a mess, but if you're going to have them, put a non-police officer on the trial boards. And they're saying, oh, a few years ago, you were focused on civilians on trial boards. Now it's not enough. It's like, yeah because we negotiated the trial board to be open to the public. And because of that, I saw a trial board. And after seeing a trial board, I want to destroy the trial boards because they're freaking ridiculous. We should have been negotiating to destroy the trial boards from the beginning, but we didn't have a massive global uprising against, against racism and policing uh, back in 2014. <laughs> we originally brokered the deal of how we wanted these changes to do. So again, there are creating this illusion that the woke position supported by the black female um, leader of the House of Delegates, Adrienne Jones, Baltimore County, is this silly compromise with trial boards. And again, no independent investigatory power. If you were serious about, a reasonable person could, seri could logically conclude, I don't trust the chiefs. The chiefs, as I said, are not good guys. <laughs> they have their own interests at heart. They're tied into this whole network of perf and uh, finance capital and political uh, side of hand, whatever. So you can, you can a, a reasonable person could conclude, I just hate the chiefs. But if you do not have an independent investigatory body that is accountable to the community, there is nothing. And I mean nothing you could do to make that trial board not a complete and utter farce. 
So the fact that they do not support independent investigatory power with the trial board shows you that their advocacy is not genuine. It's a political compromise they're trying to use so they could send woke tweets out about Breonna Taylor's life mattering, and they could get good headlines in the Washington Post and the Sun because the journalists there, most of them don't know no better, but not actually deal with empowering community. So it's these nuances that we have to do the work of explaining to people so it doesn't appear like a technocratic distinction. It's a distinction about whether you think Black people are human beings with their own sentient ability to govern the institutions that govern their lives or not. And if you don't think so, then you don't trust them to ever put pressure on the chief in a way that makes them do the right thing. And we should have trial courts. But if you do believe that black and brown working class people have the right to, to that power and, and they can use it responsibly, then you find where the inflection points for them to express that power truly are and you eliminate the impediments to the production of those pressure points, those inflection points. And that's what repealing the LEOBR would do. Thank you. I'm gonna give it back to Andy. Andy, you're muted. Sorry, a question from the group is, can you say more about slide, uh, the slide policing 506 and the statement that um, maybe, I think the statement was that may be true somewhere like Baltimore, there's little option outside of doing the right thing. I, actually, I, I yeah. Yeah, the, the, there were a bunch of things there on that slide, but I think he's talking about the Baltimore Sun out there. So the Baltimore Sun did an out there on what they said policing reform should be, and they backed the package of bills produced by the Speaker of the House, Adrian Jones of Baltimore County, which basically said, some people, like Jill Carter, who was the champion on this issue, who's been working on it for 10 years, some people are saying we should just appeal the LEOBR and let the chiefs decide. That might work for a police chief in Baltimore City where there's a lot of pressure if something goes down to, like, fire the cop. And what they think that is is because of the consent decree. Because they think the consent decree produces the pressure. That is a tell. That tells you that you're dealing with a technocrat who does not understand grassroots power and does not trust regular grassroots people. The consent decree is a federal legal intervention into a police department um, that for the most part is a bunch of technocratic bullshit. I don't know how else to put it. It's all about lawyers debating in courtrooms about how to legally change the BPD procedure on paper to make it look less racist. There is no space in the consent decree process for broad-based participatory power of the community to manifest itself, unless you're trying to get into whole, the whole legalese jargon of the consent decree. But we are, again, American elites are taught that the courts are the counter-majoritarian institution that protects oppressed people. So the person who wrote the Sun op-ed has been steeped in that untruth for however long they've been alive. So of course they talk about the consent decree that's just what you do. The reality is that you cannot rely on lawyers to do anything for you. Lawyers are lawyers. They reflect the self-interest of their clients. And what we need are broad-based participatory institutions that create inflection points to express public power. And having the chief of police have be the sole individual with a buck stops with him or her lets everyone in the community know if the cops are crazy, that's who you go after. You go after the mayor and you tell them to fire the chief. I can put that in a tweet. I can tell it to somebody on, on North Avenue and Fulton and they get it. Talking about trial boards and consent decrees and constitutional policing. Not only is that abstract, people don't care because they instinctively know what role do I have to play in any of that? It doesn't sound like I have no power over any of that and they're right. So what you need to do is you need to have a participatory system allows people to push, um, again, hopefully, not just through political pressure, but through an independent investigator. We, we, you, if only police can investigate police officers. So every civilian review board is inherently toothless because they cannot do independent investigations because of the law enforcement officers of rights. If you repeal the LEOBR, you can put more money into a civilian review board and make them basically an alternative to internal affairs that people actually trust. 
you can have them hire lawyers to do actual interviews on the ground with people to figure out what happened when the cop is accused of wrongdoing. And they could use that knowledge to put pressure on the chief of police to fire people. So you need both. You need the chief of police to be the sole decision maker at the end of the day. And you need independent investigatory power within a, a, a civilian review board type entity. But the Sun doesn't believe that. The Sun believes that if we had civilians on trial boards, that would eliminate police policing themselves because whoever wrote that Sun review has never been to a trial board. They don't know no better. That is the, um, I think, somewhat um, kind <laughs> interpretation of what's happening there. You could just say this person sounds like they're ignorant and they're just repeating the logic of the Democratic Party. But I'll leave that up to you. So at a specific moment, you mentioned inflection points. And I'm asking, um, somebody from the audience is asking if you could like expound on that, elaborate on that. So, so this is important because this is a, we think differently about this than most people. And it's not because we're smarter than most people. We've just researched and experienced a bunch of different stuff. And we've come to a different conclusion than a lot of even people that most people like and trust. So what we're saying is that even my desires three or four years ago, so I'm not, I'm not innocent of this. I, I, I had to change my mind. The, the, every law you pass in a white supremacist capitalist country is subject to co-option. This is part of the abolition versus community control debate that I tried to talk about briefly. People don't trust reforms and they're right not to. So what they try to do is, well, if I'm gonna pass the law, I'm gonna make the law super specific about all the checks and balances, all the stuff that has to happen so that it doesn't get co-opted. And the reality is you could write a perfect law, but without broad-based grassroots participatory power to enforce the law, the law is irrelevant. So as opposed to depending on the text of the law itself, to do the work for you, to prevent co-option, to allow for the power of the community to manifest itself in law, what you need to do in addition to that, and when in conflict instead of that, is our argument, is think about policy through the lens of creating spaces and decision choke points, points where if enough people got mad enough, there is a clear moment where they can define and take control of the process. And that is a different way of thinking about how you do grassroots political advocacy and how you think about legislation than what most people have been taught to do. Most people have been taught to like the Elizabeth Warren School of Political uh, Law Writing, where you write out these immaculate, beautiful Rube Goldberg machine style bills where on paper, it's beautiful. On paper, Obamacare is beautiful, right? It's this beautiful ballet of market-based mechanisms, everybody operating their rational self-interest but in reality, it was a shit show. And part of the reason it was a shit show is because Obama underestimated the recalcitrance of conservative lawmakers. Obama gave them free money, free money from the federal government to expand Medicaid. And the conservative lawmakers said, it's in my self-interest to show you the middle finger and reject your free money, even if it's poor white people who would be the primary beneficiaries of that free money. The Obama people never thought something like that would happen. And because of that, their beautiful theoretical bill went up in flames. A bunch of other stuff too, with a Republican bill that was bullshit. But this is what I'm talking about. The impetus is many smart, caring people have been taught through school, through watching the West Wing or whatever, that if I write this elegant bill that has all these procedural mechanisms of public accountability, then it will ensure that the money doesn't get wasted, the money doesn't get stolen, the money doesn't get ripped off. I think in Illinois, right? They put all that evidence-based public health processes into the bill. And what they did was to make sure that no working class black and brown people could get access to their own reparations fund. And again, it's not always a nefarious cabal of evil Svengali's tricking you <laughs> by writing legislation that they're trying to sell you with great but really serves their interests. It's well-meaning people who believe in a theory of change that says, let's enumerate everything we possibly can in legislation because we think that will help us ensure fairness. And reality is fairness flows from the power of community to force enforcement onto the bill. The bill cannot enforce itself. So you need to be thinking of legislation as a community organizer, 
as opposed to a, a policy wonk or a lawmaker. That is different than how most people are taught to think about legislation. So that's why we say for the cannabis stuff, you could keep the cannabis stuff in Annapolis and get a, 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 a council of wise men and wise women who are the world's elite experts on racial equity and they could decide who gets the money. But in reality, that's not gonna happen. It's gonna be political um, power deciding who is an expert. And these experts themselves are not connected or accountable to community. So most, again, well-meaning, liberal, multicultural leftists think that we should have, you know, this elite technocracy. We should have the panel of experts decide who gets the money. I don't think that anymore. What I think is that if you had a bill go through city council, I could bring 200 people to the city council meeting and shut it down until they produced a process for that bill that allowed for genuine grassroots participatory democracy. I can't bring that number of people to Annapolis, and I know that. I can't keep them in Annapolis day after day. They don't know the people in Annapolis. They know their city council person. He might be a piece of trash, but they know him. <laughs> and that creates a different moment of political inflection compared to going to Annapolis. And because I know that, I have changed the way I have thought about how to conceptualize racial equity when you think about lawmaking. And again, I've had to go on an evolution where I realized the way I thought I was being helpful five years ago was actually more the problem than the solution. And it's scary. It's scary because if the bill goes to city council and the city council is on some bullshit, they're going to produce a shitty bill and we're going to miss out on it. But if the bill stays in Annapolis, it's basically guaranteed that that's going to happen anyway. So at least going to city council gives me the possibility of doing something like the, uh, what they did in Jackson, Mississippi, which was destroyed budgeting process. Because if, he, if that bill goes to the State House of Mississippi, of course they're not going to get anything good from the State House of Mississippi. But they, they, they focused on the municipality because they knew in majority Black municipalities, that's where the power could manifest itself. Is it possible that power could be misused in non-majority Black municipalities? Absolutely. But it creates an opportunity to do something radical like Jackson did. That opportunity I don't think exists within any model that keeps decision-making power in somewhere like Annapolis. It's as simple as that. It's very complicated, but it's also very simple, <laughs> you know? Lawrence, I have a question from the chat. Uh, and the question is, how do you see the communities of different ethnicities coming together today? Do we only focus on common issues and ignore the racist opinion for the sake of greater good? They kind of did that in the Judas and, uh, in, on Judas and the Black Messiah. Um, well, I wouldn't use the movie as a model for community organizing. <laughs> even the people who did the movie said, don't do that. <laughs> but even in that movie, um, so as I said before, I, like old school panthers, that was their saying, like, you know, black power for black people, brown power for brown people, yellow power for yellow people, white power for white people, red power for red people. And I think for something like cannabis reparations, that makes sense. I don't know what Peachy County needs to restore its civic fabric from the war on drugs. I don't know what Western Maryland needs to restore its civic fabric from the opioid epidemic. But I trust if those people had decision-making power, they could use their personal expertise to fight for something that was in their self-interest. Now, what I don't want is, again, when you say public health, when you say social determinants of health, the reality is you might as well just say Bloomberg, because Bloomberg dominates that field. And I have worked with institutions affiliated with Michael Bloomberg, and it is not a good situation, <laughs> which is why I had zero hope for the Illinois bill to be anything but bullshit. And it was probably worse than I thought it was going to be. So the reality is, is that all you need to do for us to work together it's for you to believe that what's in your self-interest jives for jives with a political position that's also in my self-interest. We don't have to like each other. We don't have to agree with each other. We don't have to um, have any other interests. But if this bill is structured this way, if the decision-making power is in the local body as opposed to the state body, that's in both of our mutual self-interest. So if that is the ideology, then that creates the space for working class brown people, working class white people and working class black people to have a shared interest against, again, this multicultural technocratic class that believes that they know what's best for everybody. And again, it's not a preference. It's not an issue of, 
I don't like these people. They reflect a managerial ideology that says that poor working class, black, brown, and white people basically need to adopt the culture and structures of the prosperous, successful, normal, middle class white people. And I'm going to basically force that onto them. <laughs> I mean, a, a good example of this is drug treatment. Drug treatment in this country, they call it evidence-based practice uh, with 12-step. And, re and in reality, some people do better from 12-step, but 12-step is a religious ideology. You cannot mandate people go to 12-step because it is overtly religious. And the inculcation of helplessness, the inculcation of blaming yourself for being addicted, it can be devastating for black and brown people. Basically, like, blaming them for their own oppression, for the structural racism that led them to be addicted. It can be a devastating mental situation. And a lot of what we call addiction therapy is um, basically involuntary psychiatric commitment and or prison, and we just call it treatment. It is terrible. And white people, brown people, and black people are being subject to forced drug treatment that is not reflective of their culture, that's not liberatory, and they're forced into it because it is deemed the liberal progressive alternative to incarceration. That's bullshit. And what, what we're looking at is an entire expansion of stuff like that in the coming decade because we're shifting away from incarceration, we're shifting to this woke technocracy. And literally, that is just as bad as people being in prison. Like the levels of like psychiatric violence people experience in inpatient involuntary drug treatment is astounding. And they can't do anything about it because the only alternative is jail. So these, you know, happy-go-lucky, liberal, soft-hearted interventions are always backed up with the alternative of if you don't acquiesce to our liberal intervention, we can always just send you to jail. <laughs> so it's not an alternative to the violence of the state. It's a refinement in securing the violence of the state, and I don't accept that. And we should operate together in our own self-interest to resist what, again, what I believe will be, an ex this will be the new model of basically securing the violence of the state through laundering it through these liberal, inter technocratic, um, philanthropic interventions. Like, this is going to be the battle <laughs> of the next 20 years in America. And I I'm just saying we got to get out ahead of it, because especially after the pandemic wanes, they're going to anoint Fauci and the public health leaders as our saviors and give them carte blanche to manage everything in our society, a la what um, Adam Curtis said. And that's what we have to begin to share, a shared understanding around and build shared political coalitions around that. It doesn't have to be around everything, but needs, they, we need to have something that's built around that. We are approaching 8.30 and I want to be respectful of people's time. Jeremy, do you have one last question you want to ask before we start to wrap up? You know, I actually don't. I think this has been a very engaging and an informative presentation. Do you have any questions? Andy? No, um, I, th there's two more questions. Um, there's two more questions that are in uh, the Q&A. We'll post those for you on Twitter, Lawrence, and take it up there. Uh, I want to take an opportunity to thank you uh, on behalf of the Baltimore Green Party for coming and presenting this to us tonight. Uh, it was really informative to see your perspective on it and to understand where you're coming from and to think about some ways that we can work together to avoid that coming technocracy uh, and to think about what those inflection points might be when we're talking about policy to give people the power that they need in order to have control within the community. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Before we leave, I do want to turn it over to Ashley um, and have Ashley, um, who is the membership director for the Baltimore City Green Party, um, talk a little bit about the party and how you can get involved. Ashley? Hi, everyone. Uh, if you don't know already, Baltimore City Green Party is really led by the members that we have, and the donations that we get. So if you want to see events like this happen more often or support our efforts, uh, to bring in grassroots democracy. Definitely visit our website at baltimoregreens.com and donate or join. And if you have any questions, reach out to any of us uh, and we'll be, yeah, we'll definitely answer. Thanks. Great, thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you, Lawrence. It was wonderful to get to hear your thoughts on this tonight. Uh, and how can people find you if they wanna get more information uh, and read some of the things that you referenced? Um, so I appreciate you all uh, coming out tonight. Um, so uh, you can find me on Facebook, Lawrence Grand Prix. 
Uh, I'm on there more than Twitter, but you can also find me on Twitter at Neo Nubian. That's N E, the number zero, Nubian, N U B I A N. Um, in terms, so we're doing a lot on policing. That's our big issue this session. Um, but we're also doing stuff on cannabis. Again, the policing thing is um, hot and heavy right now. So um, I'm just going to be retweeting LBS Baltimore on all the things on that and be in the loop on that. You can sign up for our email list at lbsbaltimore.com. Email is like um, one of our main ways of communicating with folks. And in terms of uh, me, we also have a you know, knowledge production component to LBS. Um, broader than just the stuff we write about local politics. So, you know, talking about organizing, talking about history. And you can find that at our knowledge production reservoir that's on our separate website, uh, New Timbuktu. That's N-E-W-T-I-M-B-U-K-T-U dot com. And we have our podcast series in search of Black Power. You can find that wherever you get podcasts. So uh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, and thank you to everybody who came out. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to the next one of these, which will occur in March. We'll announce soon who the guest will be for that, what the topic will be. Follow our Facebook and our Twitter for the Baltimore Green Party um, at Baltimore Greens for both of them. And you will be able to see information about this. When this talk is processed, we will share it up on our website. We'll share it up on our YouTube. And we encourage everybody to uh, continue to participate in these talks. And we look forward to engaging with all of you and organizing with you in order to make this future uh, possible for all of us. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Dana, in the chat. And thank you, Andrew, uh, for production tonight. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.